Marie would have hunted for a grail, hidden her sex and ridden off to war, and killed without sorrow. She would have borne cruelty with a bowed head, would have lived patiently among the lepers. She would have done any of these things if Eleanor had asked them of her. For it was out of Eleanor all good things flowed. Music and laughter and courtly love, out of her beauty came beauty, for everyone knew beauty to be the external sign of God's favor. Even now, after being thrown away like rubbish, Marie considers ashamed, riding toward the glum, damp abbey that she still loved. Well, you just heard from Lauren Groff, whose latest novel conjures up an intriguing, all-female utopia of sorts, a meditation on sisterhood and matriarchy. Matrix plunges us into medieval England with the help of a formidable and fascinating protagonist, Marie. The book's just been translated into French, and Lauren's here to tell us why that's so pertinent. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, we just heard about Marie, of course, propels the book. And this central character, we meet her as a teenager when she's arriving at the, ha the Abbey, uh, reluctantly leaving France for this dingy landscape in England. There's a lot of historical truth to her. Marie was inspired by a real pioneering young woman, a poet, yes. no less. Tell yes. us who she was. So I, um, I fell in love with the work of Marie de France, who is the first published female poet in the French language. Uh, of course, she lived in England, so she's both French and English at the same time. Um, but we didn't know anything about her. Uh, we only know that, that she wrote these beautiful books. We have these suppositions that she could have been an abbess, she could have been related somehow to Henry II, um, she could have been even, some people say, Eleanor of Aquitaine's uh, daughter from her first marriage. Uh, but nobody knows exactly the details of her life. Okay, and you mentioned that poetry. The poetry sh she wrote was known as Breton Lay. Yes. Can you explain what they are and how you came across them? Oh my gosh, they're the most magnificent, weird things of all times. So I love I love the Lay. They're, um, they're rhyming poems based on very old stories um, from Brittany and uh, Normandy and also England as well and um they're they're wacky right they're they're things like um um enchanted ships in them and talking white stags and um, there's even a queer a werewolf story which is magnificent and they're just they're beautiful and they're fun and they're full of courtly romance and so um i fell in love with them back in university um way long ago and i've been trying over the years to do multiple projects and it wasn't until this book came, announced itself to me that i was able to to do something about the the lay and marie de france mm, experimental poetry then it's been around for a long time yes now exactly. as marie uh, leads the nuns of this abbey. It's a sort of matriarchy. We see a model of women being productive and quite powerful. Was writing this from a 21st century uh, perspective, a way of sketching out a possible future, looking to younger generations who might perhaps turn their back on the patriarchy? I love that you asked this question. Yes, this book was an upwelling out of my frustration with the patriarchy, absolutely. I think when um, when Donald Trump came into power in the United States of America, where I'm from, uh, all of my friends and I joked about creating our own lesbian separatist utopia, right, which is all we want to do. Um, but instead of doing that, and because I have to live in the world, I, uh, I created this book instead. So um, I would love for the next generation to refuse the hegemony of the patriarchy, to, to rise up and subvert all of the forms that keep every human being down in capitalism, in um, the patriarchy, in, you know, the constructs that the keep us bound. Mm, noted. <laughs> well, we see a wide variety of different female relationships in this book. They, we have uh, admiration, friendship, love and lust. Uh, Paul Verhoeven's recent film, uh, Benedetta, told the true story of a lesbian nun in Renaissance Italy as well. So were the parts about Marie's sexuality from your book based on research or was that imaginary? So his movie and my book actually had the, one of the same sources. In, in fact, about this, this 17th century nun. Um, it's amazingly fun to research, right? The, the alternate sexuality, the sexuality that the church hasn't countenanced or actually paid attention to throughout the history. But humans are humans, right? We have desires that don't conform necessarily to what we're supposed to desire. And so um, I just absolutely love, love this story of the 17th century nun who was uh, unapologetically lesbian and she, um, you know, she had favorites among a lot of the younger nuns. It was very, it's 
spicy. Mm. So we see there then that religious devotion and uh, sex and romance weren't incompatible. Nevertheless, you know, a thousand years later, same-sex relationships mm. are criminalised in some places with really harsh sentences, and that's based mm. on religious reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, Pope Francis recently criticised that criminalisation, but he said that uh, homosexuality was still a sin. Mm. How do you see progress on this? Today. I don't know. You know, I wish I wish there were more pro progress, of course. Um, but I do love the Pope for for standing up for um, the rights of our LGBTQI friends. I I live in Florida, and it, right now this is a place with an upwelling of kind of fascist. Um, anti-gay, anti-trans um, rhetoric happening. Um, the governor, uh, DeSantis, um, put into the school systems a, a dictate where the teachers cannot say the word gay um, because that's grooming. And so I think that even though the world, I hope very much, is is going in the right direction, there are places that are actually um, turning the the wrong way, mm. and one of those is Florida. Mm. You mentioned uh, Governor Ron DeSantis. Another part of that uh, controversial law that he signed actually affects books in mm. children's schools. Uh, they have to now be vetted and approved, and effectively teachers are confiscating some of their public library books. More than 1,600 books have effectively been banned in mm. the United States. What sort of effect do you think this is going to have? It's horrific. I mean, for for millennia, we've been trying to put books into schools. We've been trying to expose children to ideas, to language, to to um, the, a wide variety of things. Because the the more a, um, a child is exposed to, the more tolerant they're going to be. Ron DeSantis is a bad person, genuinely, as a person who has to live in his state. He is taking away the rights of our children. Um, I don't think books should be banned, right? And these are the people who scream the most about um, freedom. This is anti-freedom. This is anti-liberty. He is doing a horrible thing to the, to the children, my children. My children go to public schools in Florida. Um, I am so angry, and I hope that other Florida parents are really angry too. Mm. Now, you mentioned that as a residence, mm. resident of that state, that it's a mess, but it's gorgeous, it's a political disaster, mm -hmm. but it's full of good people. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just touch on briefly your previous book, Florida. Nature is a huge presence there with a, an eye on the climate catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's always on your mind when writing, whether it's about other things like medieval nuns or relationships? Absolutely. And thank you for saying that, because that is a big um, thread in this book and in all of my other books, actually. I, I don't know how we can live in the 21st century and not pay very close attention to the way that um, nature itself is sort of uh, falling apart under human care or lack of human care. And, uh, you know, I, I think that it's incumbents upon artists to reflect that in our work. Um, so yes, so in this book, there's actually, you know, I, I do talk about the way that humans are changing the nature around them and um, how greed and, and um, unchecked growth has done some del deleterious things throughout human history. Mm. Mm. Now, looking back at your writing, it's been critically acclaimed for its style, its insight, uh, its compelling nature. But one thing that people rarely flag up is how prophetic it is, because <laughs> your book Arcadia from 2012 describes a virus which originates in Asia and effectively shuts down the planet. So eight years later, when COVID-19 struck, how did you feel? That must have been spooky. It was spooky, but, you know, I, um, I'm a, a catastrophist at heart. I mean, I think that I think that I pr I'm a prophet just because um, I'm afraid of everything. And I, I think that disaster is around every corner. So, I, you know, I, I get it right once in a while, um, only because everything, I think, is about to fall apart all the time. So. OK, <laughs> well, I know that you're a big reader yourself, so yes. it's no surprise that when we asked you for a cultural tip, you pointed us in the direction of a book that's become a film. This is Sarah Polly's adaptation of Women Talking. Mm. Why should we see it? Oh my gosh. It is one of the best films I, I've seen in years. Uh, Sarah Polly is a genius. She's a Canadian director. Um, Mar uh, Rooney, Rooney Mara is in this film. There are a lot of incredible actors in this film. It's, a, it's uh, based on a book by Miriam T um, Taves. Um, she's Canadian as well. It's such a profound book. It's like a... Um, 
It's a Greek tragedy. And Sarah Polly, in order to adapt it to the screen, has made other choices, which I found really fascinating, too. It, it, it deepened the book in a different direction. And I, th I just think it's so beautiful. It's, it's, it's feminist, um, it's angry, and it's really deeply profound. OK, thanks very much yeah. for the tip, for the book and the yeah. film. And thanks for joining us today, Lauren Gray. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Well, we'll leave you then with a clip of Sarah Polly's Women Talking. Do remember, you can get more arts and culture on our website and our social media channels. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. We have been preyed upon like animals. Maybe we should respond like animals. How would you feel if in your entire life it never mattered what you thought. When we've liberated ourselves, we will have to ask ourselves who we are. The world is ever changing. The news doesn't wait. France 24 gives a global perspective that an educated, intelligent, and active viewer is going to want to have to be able to fully understand the issues of the day. That's why it will always be there to help make sense of world events. J'ai l'habitude de suivre France 24 partout où je me trouve, et ce grâce à mon smartphone, parce que je ne reste pas souvent devant la télé. Quand une information survient sur la toile, j'utilise l'application de France 24 pour vérifier l'authenticité. For the best international coverage, 24 hours a day, no matter what, France 24 is with you everywhere, all the time. Liberté, égalité, actualité. actualité.